So happy that you came out to appreciate with us Chinese temples. Um, so as you entered, you saw our little sign that talk, welcomes you to our own uh, Chinese American Historical Museum in the replica 1888 Ng Sing Gung. So when you come out to the History Park, which is um, part of Kelly Park on Center and Phelan, the first and third Sundays of every month, you'll be able to enjoy our Chinese temple um, and see how it tells the story of the Chinese that came uh, from China to to actually to show love for their family because they sacrificed so much to come to a foreign country and it was because of the love for the family that they took an adventure. Um, I wanted to make sure to introduce the other co-sponsor of tonight's lecture. We have the Cultural Heritage Center of San Jose State University and it is um, coordinated by the center director Catherine Reyes Blackmer. And Catherine's here in the blue behind us. So thank you, Catherine, for co-sponsoring. Uh, we also, and then one of their board members has been helping out with the signage. And we want to thank uh, board member Peggy Cabrera also for helping out. Um, to introduce Trey May, uh, Trey May was born in Hong Kong. She received her BA from the University of Hong Kong in 1977. Her master's is in philosophy in uh, Buddhist art in 1980, and her PhD in 1984 for archaeology, both from the University of London. She was a postgraduate fellow at Wolfson College, University of Oxford from 1984 to 1987. Her early interests are the ancient and historical ceramics of Southeast and East Asia, ceramic archaeology in China, traditional Chinese temples, and temple furnishings and court life in China during the Qing Dynasty. Her current main interests are history of Chinese in Americas. She was a founder and first president of the Chinese Chinatown Museum Foundation in Chicago in 2001. Her most recent publications um, are Coming Home in Gold Brocade. It tells the story of the Chinese in early Northwest America. And she very successfully helped coordinate a very um, great weekend last weekend at Marysville. And we talked about uh, Chinese temples from many different states uh, and ar around the world in Singapore also. Uh, and she's also authored this great uh, publication, Three Chinese Temples in California, Weaverville, Oroville, and Marysville. So I hope you'll be able to, I'll have a copy on the table if you'd like to see those. These are really great. Um, indicators of who we were from long ago. So, thank you. So, please welcome Jay May Ho. I could, we just finished an, a conference at, in Marysville, and I was telling Barbara that uh, how fun it was. Um, the conference actually was all focusing on temples, but we have decided on the title of this talk actually quite a few months ago. Uh, working together with the uh, CP program and working together with, uh, with Chris. I didn't, oh, Chris is behind the camera. That's why I didn't see him. So and the idea is um, they, they want to meet you, actually uh, talk a little bit about the work that we are doing. I love, I and my uh, research partner, Bennett Bronson, and my life partner as well. We live in Seattle. And since we come for the conference, that it might be a good idea for us to Take a look at Ng Gong again. You know, I, I would love to come here every weekend if I can, but it um, uh, won't work out that way. So instead, I brought my uh, two good friends, and they are my guru in temple studies from Singapore. And here's Victor, who's sitting here. So Victor, say hi to everyone. Uh, and uh, Victor's good partner. Uh, Dora is sitting at the very, very end of the room. She is probably a little tired. We, uh, we just went to Ng Sing Gong before we came here, and they were just woo and wah all the time. <laughs> so, so what I really want to, um, to talk today, uh, as discussed with, uh, with, the, uh, with the programmer here, is to just talk a little bit about uh, the new book that we, we, we just published, which came out in February. And the title of the book is Free Chinese Temples in California. Um, we have been asked this question 
quite a few times. Why three Chinese town, but why three? And so we actually recognize that there are actually a lot more old Chinese temples built before 19, let's say built before the First World War. There are a lot. And a very rough count, you want to have a guess? How many old Chinese temples built before 1910? What? 50. 50. One say 50. Barbara, you want to guess? <laughs> She's having a gum quad in her mouth. She can't say anything yet. I tell you, it's three times. And that is a very conservative con uh, estimate. We think there are at least 150 temples. Not all freestanding temples. Some of the temples or shrines are attached to associations. But 150 uh, temples or shrines, like perhaps like in Musingong, uh, were there in America built by Chinese uh, immigrants before 1910 or so. Now, I assume everyone has seen Ng Sing Gong, right? Mm -hmm. Has anyone not seen Ng Sing Gong yet? Mm -hmm. If you happen to go there to see it. So we actually just kind of highlight a few uh, places where you have major temples, and they are all over California. California has a lion's share of all these historic temples. And why? The, all, the answer is very obvious. That's where the earliest settlements of the Chinese immigrants uh, come to. They, 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 they reach California for the gold and for other, other industries, other ways of making a living. And they build settlements. And they build what we call Chinatowns. And in Chinatowns, there, inevitably, there will be one or two or even three temples. And that is why we have so many. There are other temples. There are temples outside California, too. But you want to talk about Chinese, old Chinese temples in America, California is the place that you have to, to, to go to see. And among all these, we think the three in red, Weaverville, Oroville, Marysville, they each have, still have a temple there today. And uh, we want to focus on those three temples. Has anyone seen all three? temples in all those three places. Chris has done that. Has anyone seen one? You have, the, the Fongs have seen that, all three of them. We couldn't get inside the Weaverville. Oh. We, we've gone two times and we've always, we peeked through the, the little slats. Oh, what a pity that you have made such a long trip to go there. But it's lovely. It's, a lovely. it's lovely. Next time, uh, let me know. We have insiders uh, okay. uh, uh, connection right. now. <laughs> and uh, you know, if you haven't seen any of those, and Marysville is the closest one, it's very easy to see. Uh, but uh, plan your next vacation, and Riverview is beautiful, and uh, you can just have a very, very good weekend there. I think they open from Wednesday through Sunday for sure. Monday, Tuesday is not open. Um, so we want to just talk about those three temples. And why those three temples? Because those three are still original. The buildings are still what they were like when they first built it. And all, most of the other temples either disappear or gone, but these three are in situ. And so they are old, very old, you know, they built in the 1870s, uh, or a little later. And then they, are still, they still retain the original look and the original uh, function. Uh, the one in Riverwell and Overwell, they are no longer temples. They are, they are temple museums. You cannot burn incense there. And you kowtow, people will ask you not to. I mean, kneeling down and kowtow to the deities. And, 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 and that is not what they want to encourage. They want you to appreciate them as museums. But Marysville is the one that is still an operating temple. It's still a religious house. And uh, it has a lot of original features. Highly, highly, highly recommended. And if you want to go schedule next year in March, check out their website, because they have an annual festival. It's something to see. They have been doing the same thing in the past 136 years. And it's uh, fa fabulous in that sense. So um, we produced this book, and it's all um, self-published. 
uh, most wonderful way of publishing things these days. So if you want to uh, get a copy, you can log into Amazon.com. Uh, that is the easiest way to get it. And so since our title is called New, new Light on Old Temples, so what kind of new things that have we find out from, uh, from our research? Even the book is meant to be a tourist guidebook, but we, we did serious research and then we think we have found out something interesting. Details are always uh, uh, wonderful if you care to look into it or pay attention, really look closely to the temple objects. And so I want to um, let my uh, research partner, Ben, to tell you what kind of new things that we have found out from those three temples. Ben. So yeah, so what we wanted to talk about is that because um, we have been spending some time going around looking at these temples and um, going through their contents, um, because of the fact that Treme is um, pretty good at reading temple inscriptions, the reason why she is, she's had a decent education, but also the most important part of her education was being dragged around to many temples when she was a girl by her mother and her great aunt. So she has this kind of view of temples, and one of the things it means is she understands some of the terminology, which is very puzzling even to many advanced um, uh, students. Um, with highly, uh, with good Chinese educations, they still don't understand what those temples are really talking about. Um, the first one we'll talk about is Weaverville's One Limb Temple, Temple of the Forest, uh, t Temple of the Forest in the Clouds, so-called, by the um, by the um, state of California. This is um, built originally in 1874. Like almost all other survi all surviving temples in California, it contains material from even earlier temples. And this is um, a very important thing. In fact, this is, I think, a discovery that the temples are sort of collection points for material for temples, other temples from earlier periods in the same area, which have since become defunct. So the earliest object in the temples is frequently earlier than the temple themselves. There's, um, this is just an example. We did not make this discovery. This was discovered several years ago. Um, at the back of a series of banners, there are nice, a bunch of nice Chinese paintings, actually quite competent. Why they painted good paintings on the back of parade ban banners is still not understandable. No one, of course, has ever com commented on this. And this is very common that so many of the features of these temples are obscure, forgotten, not mentioned, and actually um, perhaps do not pertain to modern temples in other parts of the world. And one reason why these temples is, are important, among other reasons, is you may say, why should we look at these? Why shouldn't we go to China? And we can see real temples in China. The reason why is there are very few surviving real temples in China. Uh, most temples were destroyed and the, during the Cultural Revolution or before, and they were cleared out and used as tractor barns or as pig pens or whatever, and they were not used as temples. All of the, all of the interior of the temples was gone. The rebuilding was not terribly good. Many are open again now, but if you go into them, even some of the most famous tourist attraction temples in China, you will see that everything in them is a modern, um, is, is modern. All of the original contents are gone. So if you want to see a temple with a lot of with its original content as put there by the people worshiping in the 19th century, this is a pretty good place to come to, to California. Also, I may say that Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, um, Taiwan to some extent, Indonesia are also good places to see original Chinese temples, but actually China is not so much. Oh, also Hong Kong and Macau are excellent places for Chinese temples. One of the surprising things, when you look at these very carefully and when you have quite a lot of help from local people in the temples, is you can find very surprising things. This unprepossessing flag stand. This is a stand. You have one like it here in the Nshingong Temple. This is a flag stand that goes on the altar. 
um, uh, on a Chinese altar. At the other end of the altar, or next to it sometimes, is a seal, a Chinese seal. And the reason for these is that the, um, is that the god is also a judge. So when a case comes before the god, which is you, the, um, god, um, the, 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 the god hears the case and instructs um, through the fortunes that you throw, the fortune slips that you throw, instructs the temple keeper in whether or not you have, um, it's okay. When the sentence is issued by the god, the temple keeper takes the god seal, stamps it on a piece of paper, and then like a real Qing Dynasty judge, he pulls a flag out of the flag stand, different flags for different sentences, throws it on the floor. This actually, of course, the god does not really do this, and the god's supernatural attendants then carry out the sentence. That's what a flag stand is for, and it indicates the judicial function of Chinese deities. This flag stand is interesting because it's very old. This is, in fact, it dates to 1861. It's the only Xianfeng um, emperor reign object that we have ever seen in North America. The only Chinese American object. There's many, many in museums, but they've been imported from China in later years. This was used by Chinese Americans. In fact, it was probably made by Chinese Americans, probably in Oroville. It's not beautiful, it's not very exciting in appearance, but it is the oldest Chinese American object in existence as far as we know. There are, of course, historical records and things like that, but there's no written uh, records, there are no original written documents by Chinese that are this old, only this. So this is an exciting find. We met, this was kind of worked out together with the keeper of the temple there, a man named Jack Frost um, in Weaverville, and we were very excited at the discovery. This is what the main altar at Weaverville looks like. You can see it's very elaborate, very complex. And looking at it and disassembling it into component parts in your mind takes quite a little while. But just this is actually the seal of the god. And the flag stand is somewhere over here in the back there on the altar as well. Um, you'll see that you can't see the dead. You can see some of the deities here, the deity statues, the banners, the inscriptions, all of the gilded surrounds of the altar, of the um, shrines, the altars in front, all of these are common features of Chinese temples. And you will see that the Yingxing Gong, the quality of the Yingxing Gong material is excellent. And um, one of the nice things about it, which particularly impresses me, is that this is one is okay, but many surviving replicas of Chinese temples, some vandal has decided to make it more shiny by taking gold radiator paint and painting it. And gold paint is not a good substitute for gold leaf. You will find that the gold leaf on the Yingxing Gong Gong Temple is very beautiful and adds a great deal to the appearance of it. This has got pretty good gold leaf too, this one. Now, a third kind of find. This is, um, I won't go into this in any detail. The interesting thing about it is that the name of the temple itself, One Lim Temple, is a play on the names of two famous Chinese revolutionaries. The date, the format of the dates, and actually the inscriptions, the poetic inscriptions outside the door, like these, all of them pertain to the activities of a revolutionary organization, the Hong Chun Tang. Um, the, a, a, an offshoot of the Tin Di Hui, the famous Heaven and Earth Society. And these are revolution, this is a very straightforwardly revolutionary temp uh, temple. And one of the big mysteries is how did they dare put this outside the temple? Any of these things, the, the format of the dates, the name, the inscriptions were all enough to get you um, horribly executed in China and probably your entire family too. How did they dare do this? This is all showing very strong anti-imperial, anti-Manchu sentiments. Well, we don't know why. We don't know how they dared, but they did. And this makes the One Lin Temple a very exciting place from that point of view as well. It's an important document of Chinese political history, one of the very few surviving anywhere. Okay, now that's one kind of discovery you can make by looking at these temples enough. And it helps to know a little bit about Chinese secret societies and Chinese revolutionary history as well. Oh, yeah, these dates here. 
That date is Qianyun date, showing not using the normal um, imperial date format, most interesting and important. When you do that kind of thing, you're a revolutionary. Sun Yat-sen later on used a lot of Qianyun dates because he was a revolutionary. Now we'll talk next about Oroville. Oroville is a um, is a law is a complex of three temples. Um, it contains material from at least three temples going back some distance in time. Um, it is outside. It has a very handsome large iron cauldron, um, cauldron incense burner, um, a thing which you see frequently in China and in Southeast Asia. This is the only one in the United States, as far as I know, made out of cast iron. The interesting thing about it, there's a legend, is that it was donated to the city by a, an emperor who is great, by grateful because his daughter was living in Oroville. Now, was there a, a, an imperial princess living in Oroville? Probably not, but it's a great story anyway. <laughs> it does have an emperor's name, but that's just the date on it. It's another one with a date of the, um, of the, um, of the um, third of the Chinese, Chinese emperors whose names appear on objects here. Um, here, for instance, is another many, many interesting things to see in these. This is an imperial flag, a very big one, that was made for the visit probably of some imperial official. Um, the mo main interesting thing about it is that um, we didn't know it existed before. We're being shown to it by the, well, the keeper of the temple there. Another interesting thing is this is a thing which we didn't re recognize existed until we went to this. This is the so-called Boon Temple at the Oroville. And it, it turns out to be, in terms of the inscriptions, and you would not know it if you didn't understand the Buddhist inscriptions, this is the only pure Buddhist temple that we know of that, um, from the early period in North America. It has very little on um, the way of Buddhist relics left. There's almost no statues left. That's the interesting thing. And this, they used to have a bunch, obviously, and they're all gone now. Here are the statues that you still have. This not very nice object, which comes from a restaurant somewhere and was, is not in part of the, of the Chinese tradition of Buddhist iconography by any means. And this here, which is actually quite a nice statue, but that's actually not a Buddha, that's a monk probably a relative of an ancestor of the family, the Wongs, that donated much of the temple. Um, but, well, I guess a monk would not be an ancestor, but a relative. And it's a nice statue. But this is the kind of thing you find. What has happened in this case to the Chinese statues? And I may say we have lots of, in all of these temples, you have references to Guan Yin, the goddess, Buddhist goddess of mercy. She is, she is a popular goddess among Taoists as well, so it doesn't mean these are Buddhist temples. But what has happened to the Guan Yin's? There are no old Guan Yin's, very few in these temples. There's very few Guan Yin shrines. The Buddhist temple here is almost emptied out. What has happened to the Buddhism, um, which was a minor, a secondary religion compared to the Taoism of the 19th century Chinese America, but what happened to them? This is a mystery which is not yet solved. The main temple at Oroville now is um, a very interesting place. It's got lots of ins bo inscription boards. All of them, of course, are datable, like all inscription boards. Lots of other dated material in it. It's very, very rich in terms of iconography and epigraphy. The most interesting object here, for the layman like me anyway, is this. That blue thing up there. That blue, um, very, rather complex, inscription board, which looks like this, is the second oldest Chinese-American object in the world. This is um, got much nicer than that flag stand. This is a handsome piece, undoubtedly made in China, very well crafted. And you can see the date up here, Tungzhe, second year, which makes 1863, by the way. Now, another, um, the third temple I'm going to talk about very briefly here is Marysville. And Marysville is what Treme was just telling you about, famous for a Bokkai festival dedicated to the North God, Bokkai or Beidi. And um, it's um, more in terms, it's a more traditional architectural temple than the others, although it was not, I think, designed by a Chinese architect. We have, as Trey May will tell you, recently discovered a picture of a fully Chinese temple, more or less like this, way up in the hills in a place called Dry Town. 
and we found a picture, no one knew it existed, a big, fancy, beautiful Chinese temple, which has now disappeared utterly. It was in use probably in the 1870s or 1880s. But it's interesting that Chinese temples here were not all little um, inconspicuous places. They put money into it, there was a lot of pride, and they served an important purpose to the people living in the area. The main shrine now, the Bokai Temple, of the, of the main temple, of the temple in Marysville is like this. There are five deities, a handsome dragon painting in the background, and the usual amount of beautiful carved woodwork with gilding on it. Now, one of the things here is they've got lots of inscription boards. If you are good at reading Chinese and you're interested in studying some of these things, there's a lot to be gotten out of it. They have many inscription boards stacked up or piled up against the wall in a back room in the, in the basement, more or less. And this is going through these with the president of the local Chinese, um, Chinese um, Temple Association, and that's Treme, is it right there, who is looking at these inscriptions as they come out. The boards come out one at a time. These are fascinating, these ones. There's lots of important information about individuals, about donations, about organizations, and about the dates that they were active in the history of Marysville. Here now we have a, um, an interesting case too. This comes from, you see here is, there are two altars that are kind of facing each other. There's an altar in front, you can't see the elaborate carving and a facade of the altar. Then there's another altar in back, you can't see very well. But that one now has got also, it's got a painted facade and it's a good deal earlier than the one in the front. The only way you can get to see it is you crawl underneath. But by crawling underneath, here again we have a couple of enthusiasts crawling underneath, looking at the, at the temple, painted temple facade, and indeed it's early. This date, 1871. It's earlier than the present day temple. It's earlier than a couple of other temples there. So this probably pertains to an Uratu, a temple, which we think it was probably built about two years before 1871 in that same general part of Marysville. Marysville, we believe, had at least six temples in its history. The present day one is dates to 1880, but there was a whole series before that. And again, this, this particular group of temples reflects community strife. There was lots of disagreement among people in the community. There was um, lots of interesting things going on. This particular um, um, shrine or temple, this particular altar, was actually burned um, during a fire. You can see how, this, how the top part is burned there, but still it rep it's an important relic of Chinese American history. So now we will talk about what we've learned in general. Trey May will take over again and sum this up. But as you can see, these are interesting things. There's a lot to be gotten out of looking at. So we have uh, given you a guided tour to visit those three temples. And uh, like them, like those, uh, the, the look of them. But you know, we keep saying that these are very beautiful things. But it really, the slides do not do them any justice. You have to see them, to see the fine carving and the color and the kind of the whole atmosphere. So do plan a trip to go and see them. Now, having talked about that, then I want to kind of look at certain things and, and share with you and explore with you some ideas. We know that those three temples, and in fact, most of the temples that uh, listed on the map earlier, they were built sometime in the kind of late 1860s through, uh, through 1880s. And for those who are familiar with Chinese American history in California, we know that starting from exactly that period, it was the worst time for the Chinese American in America because you read so many books and so many articles about that was the period in 1882, you know, the anti-Chinese uh, exclusion law was passed. And then in the 1870s onward, there are a lot of uh, 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 driven out instances. Uh, China, Chinatowns were burned and Chinese were forbidden to do this, not allowed to join any, uh, uh, some, some particular kind of careers. 
And so it sounds like we are hearing from a lot of publications and discussions that during that period, the Chinese were really underdogs, and then they were being suppressed, and life was difficult. And I think it was. It, life was difficult. Yet, we have to explain why during this period, this kind of very difficult period, why the Chinese put in so much money, so much effort in bringing objects, you know, ordering specialized, uh, specially commissioned objects, order them from China, from their hometown sometimes, or from their uh, big cities in, near their hometown, to bring them all the way to America to build them. And in the case of Weaverville, in the case of Maryville, they even have to be particularly interested in building architecture that is Chinese. Very showy, right? So why? Why do they do that? And we don't really, really have any, any answers to that yet. But we hope maybe we, together we think about it, we explore those issues, maybe we can have some suggestions. And then another thing is that they seem to be very, um, very keen on doing things in a right way, in a traditional way, in a way that was used in China. So they are making a huge point by designing things which looks very familiar, actually look at the uh, old temples in, uh, in, in Hong Kong, Macau, Singapore, Malaysia. They're very similar. They're not that much different. So there's a, 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 an effort to make them look authentic. And then the other thing is that all these items, you know, the wood carvings and, uh, and, and some of the uh, bronze uh, objects, and many of the things you see in Ng Gong temples, they're expensive. These are not things that you just kind of throw your money away. You no, know, these are expensive items. So they are doing that for a reason, and maybe for more than a reason. So that is something that we want to pay attention to. And when we just look at the objects, one of the things that we want to point out is that those objects are, are really not just expensive, these are nice work. And you look at Ng Sing Gong, that is the, the items you can look very closely. These are nice carving, fine work. And many of them are really reaching the quality of uh, museum collections and collectors that kind of go after them. So these are not just uh, little things that are tucked away in a folk village temple. Not that they're really having an eff making an effort to make them look nice. Real money being put into it. And in a way, not only real money, though, it also reflects the strength of the communities behind it. They have the money to buy. They have the money to organize. So we are actually not only looking at temples. We are looking at the strength and the organization skill behind the temples. And then, <clears throat> but for us, for, for people who, who want to look at temples, to do research, to, to, to understand a little bit more beyond just the temples themselves, what's most fascinating are those objects that bear information otherwise not available. You know, early Chinese documents are rare, and uh, many of them might have been discarded or burned or whatever, but these, the boards that we have just looked at, they are actually the direct voices coming from the communities in those old days. And I'm going to give you some examples. For, for instance, in Oroville, one of the three temples, now Oroville have three temples, one of the three temples is this one. This is the Sui Jingbo or the Chen Family Association Temple. And inside, you now you have a regular shrine and uh, a sedan chair and some chairs, and then some just kind of plain boards. These are just boards. But if you look closely at those boards, you see them, they are full of inscriptions. They tell you that these are actually records, just like many of the, your fundraising projects, right? You will have the names of the donors, how much they pay, and uh, what is this project for? We have that level of information. We basically have a, have a whole list of the entire town of Overview there. So for researchers, this is go to mind, right? We, we, we know the names, the full names, and how, and, 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 and how generous they were. And then another example is in the Pokai Temple in Marysville. And when you go into the temple, right away you see a huge board. This is uh, uh, about my height. 
And then again, the same thing. This is a donor spot. It has all the donors' names in 1880 when this temple was built, and they give and they tell you how much they they uh, they gave. And for us, for me in particular, at the very very bottom line, they they read from kind of horizontal rows. The, the very bottom row is uh, a list of women donors. So uh, they. It's wonderful because there's so little about, so little we know about uh, women in those days. So we actually have a list of women's names and how much they give. And what's more interesting is that most of those women's names have no surnames. They are just given names. And we think that actually reflects that these are probably not uh, 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 regular women, they are more likely to be maybe prostitutes, that they are not uh, used to carry their last name. But it's interesting, interesting in that sense. But what's more interesting is that the same board was used in argument of some other discussions that this temple was built as early as 1854. So Bokai Temple was being um, argued as the earliest Chinese temples in America. However, this temple states very clearly it was built in 1880. So by paying attention to the inscriptions in temples, we actually learn something new. We are able to, to, to reveal and reassess the earlier discussions on temples. And then another thing is, this is um, Marysville um, uh, Bokai Temple, when you walk into the to the, to the entrance that you see a horizontal board over there and I'm having the, uh, the enlargement here. Here we, we also learn from the inscription very clearly that the um, temple management uh, committee uh, consisted of 10 individuals and 30 business. So it really, the temple really belonged to the community, right? So it was managed by at least 40 uh, uh, individual, either business or, or, or persons. And yet, earlier uh, discussion of the temple management issue, they identify only four. They, say, they keep saying that there were four different parties managing the temple. So we think if we pay attention to that kind of uh, records, and we probably will have a different understanding of temples and of community. So that is what we did for our book. And we asked ourselves, what is next? In fact, we have the answer before we started, because that actually has been our desire all along. We want to document, we want to catalog all the lost or current temples here in America. And there are quite a few of them, as we said. There are about 150 of them. So we want to locate where they are and, what, and, and how did they function and what else is left. And then we want to publish, publish the information in a book format, hopefully next year. So that is what we are going to do. And that effort will include Ng Sing Gong. And I'm so happy because Ng Sing Gong is one of the best study uh, uh, old temple in America now. That means I don't have to do so much work. Wonderful. Uh, everything is already done and so laid out, and uh, the history is work on, has worked out, and the details work out. So I'm very grateful for the CHCB have done so much work for so long, you know, several decades. So this is uh, when we come to Ng Sing Kong, that would be an easy job for us. However, there are some questions that I or some issues I want to raise for having been uh, shown Ng Sing Kong several times. I, I think. Ng Sing Gong is no different from other temples in a way that it might have been served as a kind of depository for older objects in the community or for older temples that once exi uh, uh, existed before the Ng Sing Gong was built. And we know from different sources, Ng Sing Gong was, uh, was established in 1888. Am I right about that? You know, it's 1888 or many of the objects there dated to 1889. But this particular item, I mean, the light is not very good, but if you go in just behind the, the bell, the drum and, and, and the bell stand, is two 
uh, pose with a lot of dragon design. And on it actually has a date which can be dated to 1883. Am I right? Yes, 1883. So that actually is predated the establishment of the Ng Gong. So we have to find out where they come from. And, and I, I see Chris is nodding his head. He's going to work on it. Now, another thing that I find it fascinating is in the gallery and the ground for Ng Sing Gong, again, I'm de depending on, on them to find out more for me, for, for, for our catalog. And one is um, a wonderful picture of, uh, of a Taoist ritual, which people would do something like a Thanksgiving effort uh, at irregular uh, uh, level. And it's very interesting because we don't see much of that being left anymore. So the only surviving this particular uh, ritual ceremony was only documented by very, very few pictures. And this is one of them. And then another thing is these two poles, they are not very, not very tall about this height. And the two ends, one end is the dragon head and then one end is the tail. There are two of them. And again, I just asked Brenda today that, uh, is it really belong to Ng Sing Gong? Could it have come from an outside community? And if it is belong, if it is originally belong to Ng Sing Gong, we might have a totally different way of interpreting the community and their activities and their beliefs. What it is, uh, we'll find out more about it later, and we we'll maybe some other time we'll we'll talk about it with you. Now, so in in our in our process of trying to. Um, catalog and document the, the lost temples, I really feel that um, only Ben and I cannot do it. And then we need everyone to help. So I'm here to appeal for help. If you know of any uh, past or lost temples or shrines, let us know. We will follow up. We will want to know more. And as you, in, you know, because many have already been lost, and I don't know whether now, you all have been to Monterey, right? Monterey at one time was uh, actually a very major Chinese uh, fishing village communities. And they have temples, and they have things like that. But of course, not a shred has, has left for us, only pictures for us to see. And then there are other places. This is, uh, this is Boise. This is another temple called uh, Sui Jingbo Temple, completely gone, not even objects, and yet it's such a pity, huh? Where is that? That is in Boise, in Idaho. Oh, Boise. In Idaho. And then this one is somewhere in the Amador County area. And this is actually not a full-size temple. It belongs to uh, an association called Qigong Tong, but inside is a temple. And again, we don't know anything else about it. It's just a picture that survived. And another one is, this is something we just learned yesterday in, was it yesterday, the day before yesterday? Uh, this is in uh, New Chicago, in Dry Town. And New Chicago doesn't, doesn't exist anymore, it's all gone. But yet, look at that. Here you have a Ng Sing Gong, that means five things. Here they have Si Sing Gong, that means four things temple. And it's all built in a very traditional style, you know, all these kind of a, like a little mountain rooftop. And yet, um, no one seems to know too much about it. When we really kind of work closely with the, with the archivists who make an effort to show us the details of these writings. And on the board, the date is 1868. 1868, that is again very, very early. Very early. So, but it's all gone. And, and that, is, that is a reality. And uh, we, we just need to work harder to um, recover as much as possible. And then some of, the, some, of the, some of the temples, we know that they have been, temples do not exist anymore. But then the altars, because they're beautiful, so some of them actually have entered into museums. Uh, Ng Sing Gong is one of, the, one of the lucky ones, but some of them actually have gone to, uh, in this case, is a Chico Museum that has been on and off in the storage for a long, 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 long time. It's only actually recently, I think in the last month, it was uh, able to kind of being put, uh, put, put out together at the gallery to, to be seen by the public again. See how beautiful it is, huh? 
And then this one is really wonderful. This is Santa Barbara History Museum. Has anyone seen it? No? Go to see it. It's really wonderful. You have to go through the, along, along, go, go along the gallery, and at the very, very end of it, the most unexpected corner, then you find it. But it's beautiful. So that is something that we have to work together, uh, not just to discover or to rediscover the pictures, but also go from museum to museum to see what's still available. Well, I think that's all that we want to talk about temples. So maybe we can hear what you have to, to tell us and what advice that you might have us, for us. I see a gentleman there. I can't see your name. It's Joe. Question. I went to, uh, was going to Japan pretty frequently back in the 1980s. You go to temples that would identify with a particular Buddhist sect or a particular uh, Shinto sect there or something. I'm curious about what religious activities are going on, or whether it's strictly Buddhist or Taoist or more traditional folk religions, or what? What? Or was it a, some kind of a hybrid or mixture? I'm just curious what the, the religious. You mean the three temples that we look at? No, no. Well, sorry, we didn't, we didn't make it clear that these are basically Taoist temples, but the Taoist word is being used in a very loose manner because uh, basically uh, anything not, well, not Buddhist and anything not uh, Christian or Muslim uh, in China is being kind of considered kind of Taoist. But uh, of course, Taoist is a native Chinese uh, belief that has been going on for you know, more than 2,000 years nonstop. And over that long course of time, they develop a lot of different sects. And then here, in most of the what we call the community level of temples, that they are usually practicing uh, one or two particular kind of, uh, of uh, Taoist rituals. And um, we, maybe we can just call them maybe Jing Yi style or, but Taoism has a, the Taoism has a very long uh, vitality, very, 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 very strong vitality. They, they recreate a lot of things. They, they change with the need of the community. So there isn't such a thing as uh, very rigid Buddhism, very rigid Buddhist rites or very, um, very uh, pre-described uh, uh, approach to the to the to the to the offerings and to the to and and and, and to worship and this a lot of more fluidity, a lot of more creativity in understanding and expressing one's spirituality. I don't know whether that helps. <laughs> no, no, that's I actually enjoy going to shrines and temples around Asia. I've been a lot of places. I think the Chinese are uh, within the Taoism, they are different sets and they did fight on and off at different times. But uh, and yet at the same time, they also create many different uh, subsets to go along with it. And so it's, it's to me, I, 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 I know very little about Hinduism. But for me, when I look at Davisama, I sometimes feel that, OK, maybe these two particular type of, of religions have the same kind of complexity. It's not meant to be understood easily. And that's the way I feel about it. <laughs> so. Yes, Barbara. Um, in Almaden Valley, they're trying to reconstruct a Chinese temple that was there when the mine was busy and they had a Chinatown up there. And there was a fundraiser for that uh, right now going on in Almaden Valley. Almaden Valley. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Because they had different camps uh -huh. in, the, um, in the mines. Uh -huh. and, but right now, the, I think the the top priority is trying to resurrect the temp the Chinese temple that was there at one time. Mm. Okay. And I don't. It's, it's I don't new know. Almaden. Huh? It's new Almaden. I live down there. I live there all the time. Yeah, it's, it's new Almaden. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But out in the 
Yeah. Is that a quick silver mine? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are they still trying to resurrect the Chinese temple there? Oh, okay. That's the last time I was there. They were talking about it okay. very seriously for a change. Uh -huh. Okay, good to know. We'll follow up with that. Mm -hmm. There will be something, something is jogging my memory. April the 20th, um, might want to like look on the website of uh, Quicksilver Mine. Something is jogging my memory about April the 20th, there'll be a gathering there at the uh, Chinese walls, um, at the Nomadan area. Oh, I see. Okay. So if you, if you signed in and you, Barbara, what's your last name? Tom. Tom, okay. If you signed in, I'll, and, it, and I find something, I'll email you. Okay. Thank you. But a lot of them didn't yeah. sign in with the email address, so please add it. I didn't even sign it. I didn't even see the uh, sign for that. You're just signing an email address. Yeah, I mean, otherwise you can't contact yeah, I can get to it. I okay, yeah. No, no, no. I, I stopped and signed sheets, so because in your evaluation form. Oh, yeah. oh you can do it. Yeah, using your evaluation form, please. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Right. Yes, on the okay. top corner. Yes, thank you. Nice Do you have a question? Usually, the people build a temple. They build it somewhere underground. Do you try to find out what ha what underground? You said usually they build yeah. a temple yeah. with a, uh, with a basement, uh, with uh, underground? Why, 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 why do they want to build a, a temple here? They build some underground? Maybe. I. I have not come across uh, any temples that seem to have a, an underground uh, extension. Uh, I do not know about that. But I read something like in San Francisco, you know, San Francisco do not have a freestanding temple like that. They usually build uh, multi-level buildings. How and then, um, just buildings, a three, four story high, How? and then there, there could be a basement. But it's just like any commercial building would have a basement. So I don't know whether that is what you are meant, yeah, meant to be. But that is very, very different, uh, completely different thing. Uh, the 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 the, the uh, farm and si that you mentioned in Xi'an in mainland China. Yeah. One is a Buddhist temple, and it, we're not even talking about that level of sophistication. And those uh, state sponsor huge monastery, um, the different thing. We are talking about community temples. Community simple temples, a place for gathering, for community uh, meetings, and for worship. Yes, ma'am. Have you tried the any temples, the older temples that are still being taken care of by the families that originated, like you know the descendants of the families or the you know the communities that started the temple? Uh, Maryville's is close to that. Maryville's Bokai Temple is close. It's uh, it. Remember that the board says that it belonged to 40 um, units, and uh, so descendants of those units, especially those 10 individuals, still play a role in it. And in fact, the president, the current president now, and uh, he has that claim. He says his family came from the original. Uh, uh, huh? And yeah, Mendocino is one, another one of them. Yeah. But did you study uh, other temples all over the United States or only in California? Uh, I have seen quite a few temples outside California. And uh, yes. Well, some Hawaii or something like that. Just some in Hawaii too, you know? Yeah, Hawaii is wonderful. Hawaii yeah. with Maui. their... There's a temple in Maui, you know? Right. <laughs> the, the Hawaii, yeah, we, we have seen them, but yeah. um, we, need to, we need to go back and do more work. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, They're sure. They're mostly in California, do it. But California has the oldest, the biggest, and uh, the most. So California is important, very important. I think the China came to Hawaii but before they come to Hawaii to go to went to Hawaii, we went to California. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. Hawaii, yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, Hawaii is important. Yeah. We just kind of uh, we have we have done some work, but we need to do more. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think specifically in Hawaii. Honolulu, Honolulu would be the place to look for really early temples. The problem was is that Chinatown was burned completely 
by um, Hawaii uh, American authorities, military authorities, because of the supposed plague risk. So in 1898, 192, something like that, the whole of Chinatown was burned to the ground. And any temple in it was gone. But the Qinghao Temple is old. There are a few pieces. Yeah, the that, Qinghao yeah, Temple. A few things were, were rescued from temples on the outskirts of Chinatown, but they lost an awful lot then. Yes. Uh, Dr. Ho, I, I think you are, you are aware that in my hometown of Bakersfield, there yes. is still a small <laughs> yes. Chinese temple that is operated by several families. Not anymore. That was. <laughs> well, it, no, it, it still is. As, as no. of a few months ago, it's gone. Oh, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, well, what happened to it? What happened to it? Um, we, we actually went to uh, Bakersfield for that reason in November. And we, 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 we Google it and we make contacts and all that. And when we arrived, our contact looked extremely embarrassed and say, no, it's just gone a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and what happened was that, um, now that actually was not, that temple was, did not belong to a family. The temple also belonged to the communities. It's a community temple. And uh, then it passed from one generation to another right. generation and was in the hand of a, of, a, of a family, the last, the uh, the family. last only, yeah. yeah. But uh, they did a good job in donating the entire collection to the historical society. Oh, okay. So we saw that collection in the historical society. That was a wonderful thing. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, and then, but yet the temple site, which is very small but very cute, yeah. uh, was sold repeatedly by the time I, we arrived. It was already sold something like two times, three times for some reason. And so the temple was gone, completely gone. And so now the historic society that has the history park, very similar to the St. Jose uh, history park, and they have the job of, one, they already have a temple. They already have a tiny little temple in place. And so they, now they're debating whether they should add another one in order to put up that, uh, actually they have a very cute Chinese name for that temple called Let's sing gong. <laughs> Let us sing together. <laughs> Let's sing gong. Uh, whether they should build an, an extra one or they should use the let's sing gong material to replace the current existing little re reconstructed temple. But thank you for telling me that. I was so disappointed when I, when I stood in front of it and knew that it was all empty and gone. Well, I'll uh, talk to you after the meeting because let's I, do that. I, have, I have some altar furnishings from an older temple. Mm. I love to hear I that. Think you might like to see them sometime. I love to hear that yeah. because I've seen several objects in a community's hand that, that came from temples. So they have to, it has to be more than one temple. I think in Pakistan at least there may be yeah. maybe three. And then we only know one intact. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. You know, don't go away now. <laughs> uh, yes, Chris. Uh, you mentioned that uh, some of the temples that are most similar to the Chinese American temples in North America are not in, uh, existing in China today, but they are in Hong Kong, Macau, Singapore, places like that. How many of those are also for multiple deities? In other words, the Ying Ching Gong or for, for five deities or four deities? That seems so common here in North America. Is there anything like that in Southeast Asia? Later, I will ask my friend to answer that question. He knows a lot about Singapore and Malaysia. But I can speak for Hong Kong uh, because that's where I grew up. Yeah, in Hong Kong, and I never thought about it when I was growing up. Singong basically means multiple uh, deity pal uh, temple. Yeah, we, we do have uh, Lisingong temples in Hong Kong. And then the reason they, they do that is usually that that means that in the temple they have more than one, sometimes two, sometimes three deities. And they're usually the same, same collection of uh, deities, you know, Guan Gong, Tian Ho, and, and Chai Sen, and, that, and, and all that. But we also find that um, here in America, most of the Li Xing Gong became something else. Maybe in the course of the Singong, they, 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 they have decided maybe among the five or the three that one of them became more uh, powerful, uh, more able to communicate with the, with the public. 
So sometimes the Li Xing Gong will also carry a different name, and or the deity will become one particular deity will become more prominent, being given a different uh, or, or more important place. I saw one in Thailand when I was uh, doing work there in Bangkok, and when that was very early on, and then I thought, wow, you know, strange, you know, there's some kind of uh, some kind of uh, coup going on, and come, the the deities are kind of fighting against one another. Then it's really here in America, and I begin to see that that seems to be quite common. And Victor, you you have any anything you add to that? Yeah, actually. <laughs> In, in Southeast Asia, it's a bit more complex because the people who come down from China uh, come from Bendi, Hong Kong, Chaozhou, this part of Hong Kong, and then the Fujian. So that's quite complex. Like in Singapore, most of temples are Fujian temples. But in all these temples, there are definitely more deities. In the general uh, formation of those temples, there's always the three parts. The resident or the main deity stands in the center. And then on his or on her left is one, and then on his or her right is another one. So for instance, we have a Tianfu Gong, which is dedicated to Machu, the, the, the waters of the sea. And next to her on the left was the Guang Gong, right? And then on her right was Bao uh, Shen Tati. Now Bao Shen Tati is known to, to the Fujian as the deity of medicine. Right? So, so these three are actually people who have lived before. And the, the anthropology says that in those days in the temples, see, when you arrive on a ship, you are so glad you have, you have survived. So you pray to Ma, Ma Chu, you know. And then when you start doing business, you know, Kong Kong is the, the guy, royalty, righteousness. And when you're sick, what happened? Then you pray to our Santati because he takes care of health. And of course, there are a lot of miscellaneous because the, the Chinese also believes in the the soldiers, the celestial soldiers that guard the temple. And so you have the the Zhong Tan Yuan Shuai and this, which are basically five camps. Just like you see, if you see the Chinese Empire, there are five camps guarding the north, south, east, west, and the central. So if you go to Singapore, there's a lot. So we are still trying to identify every different statue there is. Some we know, some we still don't know. But do they call the call the temples Let Let Sing Gong? It, usually they give it a name, so so we don't don't have that so called uh, generic name like Let Sing Gong, right? So usually you just heard okay, Tian Fu Gong and uh, Ma Chu, Tian Ho Gong and all this. So it's it's more of that. So you will never know, but you can expect in almost every temple there are more than three deities, and they grow. I, every temple is trying to be a one-stop center. <laughs> <laughs> right, so when you go down there, you know, for children and also for people who want to have good benefactors, there's the tiger god. The right, tiger god is known for that. Right? Then for the underworlds, you want to break the underworld, so you have the first and second constables or camp uncles, so you just add in. So as you go along, you find more and more are being added. And right now, when some temples are trying to do restoration, they try to take them out because, hey, this were never there in the 1800s. So that's where you also have conflicts, which should be there and which should not be there. <laughs> yeah. okay. Okay. So uh, if no, if no more, no more suggestions or questions. Okay. Oh, sorry. I'm curious, how long have you been doing research on the temples? In America? How long have you been actually doing research on this topic? Um, I love temples, as Ben explained to you, that uh, when I was a little girl, just like Victor too, and many other Chinese uh, children, that you're being taken to temples by your parents, whether you like it or not. Um, maybe, you know, children go to churches for the same, well, the same reason. <laughs> and then so I, I, I was, um, I was, but I, I actually, I love going there because you know, the Chinese went to temple with a lot of offerings, and the offerings did not stay in the temple. They can bring back, and then so we children get a share of those, you know, candies and all, and all kinds of things. So I, lo I love doing that, and also because um, it's a lot of activities, a lot of fun, and a lot of color, a lot of sound. You know, that is like going into a theater. So to me, it's always being attracted to it. 
And so when I, when I was an uh, undergraduate student in University of Hong Kong, and uh, my, my, uh, my, my thesis for, for, the, for the degree was to document um, certain aspects of temples in Hong Kong. So I started at that, at that point, and I always love to see temples wherever I go. So, but, they, but those are not very, very serious research. It's really after um, I had become involved in Chinese American studies, and I was amazed to find out what? You know, Chinese traditional temples in America, and um, I know so little about how they operate and all that, so I became very, very interested in it. So lifelong interest, serious interest, oh, maybe about 10 years ago, started. <laughs>